morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming to our house church service. I love uh, getting to preach after that song. There's, there's just something about it, you know. I just, it warms my heart and fires me up and gets me ready to preach the word every single time. I hope you guys have your Bibles out and a pad, a paper, a notebook, and a pen. If you don't have uh, a pad of paper, I've got some over here if you'd like to be able to take notes. I've got pens right there in that cup. This is going to be a really, really important lesson for us all to focus on and connect with. So last Friday, I preached about family and faith. Yep. This past Friday, I spoke about faithfully advancing as a family. And today, the title of my sermon is Faith in Christ and Love for His Family. Wow. If you haven't picked up yet, there, there's a theme that we're going for of faith and family. And this is because this is something that, that we have the opportunity to grow in yeah. in a very significant yeah. and powerful way. Yeah. Um, it's been a lack of our campus ministry for a couple months. Yep. But I want to encourage you guys that, that I have seen your faith growing Aww. and I have seen us growing closer together as a family. Uh, just just with the with, with all the, the women and men who've been getting baptized, Woo! which has been incredible to see. Come on, Woo! Woo! Alicia, Woo! Coco, yes. we got oh, Diane, oh my Christian, <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, so our faith has been increasing, and I believe God has been blessing that. And in the process, we've been growing closer together as a family as well. Yeah. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3. It's going to be uh, our theme uh, passage for today. And I've got three points that, if we, if we really grasp these, will we'll really change the culture and set a foundation for what God's going to do, because God is going to move powerfully in the fall. Yeah. I don't know if you guys can feel it, but I can feel like this anticipation building when 300,000 students are going to come to Boston yeah. for their school semester. And when they come to Boston, they're going to meet each and every one of you. Yeah. They're going to come on campus and a disciple of Jesus Christ is going to come into their life and help them become disciples yeah. as well. But first, we need to set our heart and our mind on Christ. That's my point number one, is set your heart and mind on Christ. In Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1, it says, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. This first sentence is, 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 is Paul referring back to something that he had said previously. He says, since then you have been raised with Christ. Well, what, what is this raising that he's speaking of? Well, let's see. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2, and starting in verse 9, it says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority, in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised with Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So, so this is the raising with Christ that Paul is talking about. That baptism is, is a spiritual circumcision where Christ removes who you were, removes your sin, and puts the blood of himself on you. And when you're raised to life, you're raised from your old life. So if we think of going back to chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, it says we have to set our hearts and our minds on things above. Your, your heart represents your emotions. And your mind represents your thoughts. That's, that's the ancient understanding of these words. That's what they would be thinking of when they would read what Paul was writing. Now, how do you set your mind on something else besides what it is already set on? Good question. By reminding yourself that you died to whatever your mind is set on. Wow. There's this uh, 
There's this really funny movie that I really love. It's called Hot Rod. Yes. And in this movie, this guy's name, uh, his, his name's Rod, and he has this tradition where he fights with his stepfather once a week. And so there's this scene where he's putting on, like, hockey pads and, like, a helmet and, like, a bandana and all these, like, pads and armor to go down and fight his stepfather. Uh, and his stepfather's down there exercising, and so the... the Rod comes in and tries to like surprise him, but then his stepfather throws this exercise ball at him and, and this fight ensues. And at one point, the stepfather th literally throws Rod against the wall. And Rod falls down on the ground and he's, his stepfather says something that, that's very, very powerful. He says, play the victim and you will be the victim. Ooh. And you know, later on in the movie, he, he gains some confidence and, and he goes back and he fights his father again at the very end of the movie. And he actually ends up winning because he was no longer playing the victim. Wow. And so I want to talk a little bit about this victim versus victor mentality. Come on, bro. Um, and it's crazy because I was thinking about preaching this, and then Mike posted something on Facebook that spoke about this just this morning. And so I wanted to read a couple of the comparisons so that we can see the, the mentality that, that we need to shift towards. One day. So one of them says that the, the food is making me fat. This is the victim mentality. Now the victor mentality says the choices I make in nourishing my body will determine my health. A victim mentality says my parents abandoned me so I cannot trust people. A victor mentality says I can trust myself to make decisions that align with my future. Uh, a victim mentality says, my coworkers, my friends, or my peers make me feel bad. A victim mentality says, I am the only one who can choose how I feel. A victim mentality says, nobody understands my situation or what I'm going through. A victim mentality says, I am worthy of being heard and can calmly communicate my needs. Uh, sorry, that was for a different one. A victor mentality says, I am seen and heard by those I choose to invite in. Victim mentality says, I'm depressed because nobody will love me. A victor says, I understand that I create my happiness and make choices in alignment with that. And there's a couple others that, that I won't go through, but, you know, sin has the power over you that you give it. Wow. If you think to yourself, I struggle with impurity. Well, guess what? You're going to struggle with impurity. Wow. If you think to yourself, it's hard for me to connect with other people in the ministry or in the fellowship, then it's going to be hard for you to connect with other people in the fellowship or in the ministry. Wow. You want to know something? Jesus never played the victim. Oh. And he was perfect and was crucified on a cross by Romans. Think of all the times that he could have been like, well, my disciples, you know, they left me in the Garden of Gethsemane. Wow. Man, if these people just weren't so sinful, I wouldn't have had to give up my deity to come and die for their sin. Right. If these Romans would just listen to me, maybe they would see the truth and, and put the truth above, you know, the, 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 the mm, cries of the mob. Yeah. I want to I wanna go to Hebrews chapter 12. Right. Come on, bro. Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it in the Amplified Version because it's fire. Hebrews chapter 12, and in verse 2, it says, Looking away from all that will distract us, focusing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, the first incentive for our belief, and the one who brings our faith to maturity who for the joy of accomplishing the goal, set before him, endured the cross, disregarding the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, revealing his deity, his authority, and the completion of his work. Wow. wow. You know what the joy was that was set before Christ? It was Diane. You want to know the joy that was set before Christ? It was Coco. It was Kyle. It was Tutu. Yeah. It was Angelica. It was Beatrice. It was Tyler. It was David. It was each and every 
point of view. You know, so often we can get distracted by the things in our lives. Yeah. And, and sometimes they can be good things. You know, some of the things that I was distracted by in, in my first years of discipleship was school. I had finally gained the conviction that I wanted to be good in school. Yeah. Before I was a disciple, I was a drug addict and an alcoholic, and basically just existed in class. I would do my assignments super last minute just to get them done and just to throw something in. Honestly, I didn't care what my grades were. I really, really didn't because I, I was just there to live life. I wasn't really sure I was even going to graduate alive. But I had to then understand, you know, if I'm seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness, even though this is a good thing that I want to excel in, it's not going to get me to heaven. Seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness will be the path for me to get to heaven. Yeah. Another thing that I was concerned about in my first year of discipleship was dating. Mm. So I have a question. Are you more concerned about finding a relationship in the church than you are about your relationship with God? Wow. Just want to let that sink in. One second. Guys, relationships are great. Don't get me wrong. But if your relationship with God isn't on right, that relationship is never, ever, ever going to fulfill. No matter how awesome that person is, no matter how spiritual that person is, wow. if your walk with God is jacked up, it won't lead to you getting to heaven. Let's go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 21. It's at the very, very end of 1 John. I just thought it was kind of interesting that Paul, sorry, I thought it was interesting that John says this at the end of the book after talking about so many other things. He says, in his closing statement is, Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. In the New Living Translation it says, Dear children, keep away from anything that might take place, that might take God's place in your heart. Okay. Wow. So, you know, not to raise your hand and answer this question, it's kind of rhetorical, just for you to reflect in your own heart, has anything taken God's place in your heart? Has school taken God's place in your heart? Has another person or your job or anything taken God off of the throne of your heart? <clears throat> My challenge for point number one um, is to spend five minutes every morning in your quiet time remembering what Christ did for you. Wow. Melissa's communion was so powerful, um, and, and just the visual representation of the medical account is powerful. It's so powerful to think about what Christ did for us. And, you know, for me, whenever I reflect on what Christ did for me, that there's nothing that I'm not willing to do in response to that. I'm willing to share my faith with anybody because Christ died for me. I'm willing to deny my flesh and say no to my sin because, just like Melissa said, that that's putting Jesus back on the cross. So my challenge for point number one is to spend five minutes every morning remembering what Christ did for you. Yeah. Point number two is renovate your house. Turn to Romans chapter 12. Come on, bro. Romans chapter 12, and in verse 1, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is one of my favorite passages um, when it comes to words. Because the word renew in the Greek means to renovate. And so, I want you guys to imagine that... 
you know, Tyler and I are here in our apartment, and one day, you know, we realize that we have a mold problem, and it's the middle of winter. So we, we have a, a we have a company come out to to remove the mold, and so they come in with a bunch of sledgehammers, and they just start smashing our walls. They rip out all the drywall. They rip out all the insulation, and then they're like, "Hi right, guys, all right, we're we'll, we're done for now. We're gonna go on a break." But we'll come back and we'll finish things. Oh. So they leave, they go on their lunch break, and then they never come back. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. And my walls are bare. Bare. Have they finished the renovation? No. No. Mm. They've taken the old out, but they haven't replaced it mm. with something new. Wow. And so what Paul is saying here is that we have to remove the pattern of this world from our lives and replace it with the pattern of Christ. Now, what does the pattern of the world look like? What are these things that we have to remove? I'm glad you guys are asking these questions. We're so into it. Let's go back to Colossians 3, and we're going to see what the things are that we need to remove and what we need to replace them with. Colossians chapter 3, in verse 5, it says, Put to death, therefore... Whatever belongs to your earthly nature, or the pattern of this world. Mm -hmm. Sexual morality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Takes us back to, you know, taking God off of our hearts. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. So Paul is even acknowledging this is who you guys were. This is what you were involved in. This is the pattern of the world that you were a part of. But since you've been raised to Christ, you've died to these things, and you're raised to this new life. Yeah. But now, it goes deeper. Because these, the, these are the obvious kind of outward sins. These are the, the fruit of the deeper heart sins that Paul continues with. Rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of the Creator. Here there is neither Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. So he says we're to, we're to rid ourselves of anger, of rage, malice, slander, filthy language, and lying. And, and at the end he even kind of goes into a little bit about discrimination. That's why he has to say, you know, there's no Gentile, there's no Jew. It doesn't matter if you lived out in the countryside, if you lived in the city. Whether you work, or whether you're, whether you're a slave, or whether you're free, Christ is all in all. Mm -hmm. so, so many times our heart sins are covered up by like, the glaring outward sins, or sexual morality, or impurity, or lust, or greed. So I, I want to ask you, do you struggle with impurity, with lust, or with idolizing something or someone? If so, look into your heart and search for bitterness. Because there's a good possibility that it's bitterness that's being kind of covered up by all these other things. Wow. You know, there's, there's a lot that's to be said about bitterness because it, it, it breeds these, these different heart sins. I was looking at the, the differences between anger and rage and malice. And malice is, is seeking ill will of someone else. Mm. Uh, rage is, is a little bit more physical in nature, and, and then anger deals with our passion. And, and when we have these emotions, when we have these things that we've set our hearts on, these things below, rather than things above, it can turn into, well, I just want to get this to go away. I just want this to disappear. And so, for me, when I felt these emotions, I would turn into drugs. I would turn into alcohol. Um, I was talking to a brother one time, and it was really interesting because... This guy's very, very... Um, but the way that we both talked about our sin and how we went to things was very, very similar. Mm. For him, in his sin, he would become very lethargic. He would just sleep. 
all day long. He would just lay in bed. For me, I'd be like, well, I'm going to go out and get drunk and like have fun, do something that takes my mind off of it. But it showed me that our roots are all the same. Mm -hmm. The expression may be different, but we can relate to each other on the roots. So, how do we combat this? How do we fight against it? Well, the Bible says that the Word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Mm. So, a couple of scriptures that I've learned, that I've memorized uh, to help deal with my anxiety, to deal with uh, my depression, to deal with uh, just not trusting God, are Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and you will direct your paths. Philippians 4, 4 through 7, Rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but, by, but in everything, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. That the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And lastly, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He leads me beside still waters. He causes me to lie down in green pastures. He refreshes my soul. Though I walk through the valley, though I walk through the darkest valley, I will feel no evil. His rod and his staff they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. My point here is that the Word of God is what's going to help you combat your sin. When Jesus was in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights and did not eat or drink, he used Scripture to defend himself against the devil. Mm -hmm. What Scriptures do you have memorized that you can run to? What promises of God are written on your heart to defend you against temptation? So my challenge for point number three is to memorize three scriptures mm. to combat your specific sin. If it's anxiety, look up scriptures about anxiety. If it's lust, look up scriptures about lust. If it's anger, look up scriptures about anger. Mm. Whatever it is, the Word of God will help you if you don't. Lastly, point number three is put the family of God first. Come on, bro. So we're going to do the quickest survey of the book of Acts that you've ever experienced. Let's start in Acts chapter 1. Let's do it. Come on. Let's do it, bro. Come on. All right. Acts chapter 1, and starting in verse 8. All right. Let's see. So this is Jesus speaking, and in verse 7 he says, It is not for you to know the times or dates, the authority the Father has set by his own. It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So here Jesus is giving, you know, kind of a, a second half of the Great Commission, and he says, okay, you guys are going to go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. So we're going to see that happen very, very quickly. Let's go to uh, chapter 2, verse 41. Okay. It says, Those who accepted his message and were baptized, about those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to them under that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold their possessions to give to one another who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So, 3,000 accept Peter's message. They believe in Jesus. They get baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. And then they stay in Jerusalem. They don't go home. They don't go back to their home country. They stay with the church, they give to one another, and as they spend every day together, their numbers increase. And this is the pattern that we're going to see. Let's go to chapter 4, verse 4. Oh, it says, But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. So 3,000 to 5,000. Chapter 5, 
verse 14. It says, Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Boom. Awesome. Chapter 6. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing. Boom. They keep going. Chapter 6, verse 7. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So now it's not just the everyday kind of civilian in the city of Jerusalem getting baptized for forgiveness of their sins. Now priests are starting to see, wow, this is the movement of God. This isn't just some wow. like little cult that's going around. Wow. This is the very movement of God that is impacting people's lives. Yeah. We go on to, from 6 verse 7 to chapter 8 verse 4, it says, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. So now persecution has come. And it scatters the disciples. But despite their persecution, they go on, they continue to preach the word. Chapter 9, verse 31. Chapter 9, verse 31. It says, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit in increased in numbers. So when they, when they had a righteous fear of God, when they understood the, the, the gravity of their sin, they were encouraged by the Holy Spirit because they were in fellowship with one another and they began, continued to increase the number. Now go to chapter 12, verse 24. It says, But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. I love that little flourish. Now if you go to chapter 13, verse 49, it says, The word of the Lord spread throughout through the whole region. But the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. So they shook off the dust of their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. So... Again, we see persecution, we see conviction, we see the disciples sticking together with one another in the face of all this, and we see multiplication because of their conviction. All right. 14.1, go to 14.21. It says, they preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystria, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they wow. said. Chapter 16, verse 5. It says, So the churches were strengthened in their faith and grew in numbers. Chapter 17, verse 4. It says, Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. And lastly, last one, oh, sorry, actually I want to continue. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. So, from chapter 1, verse 8, to chapter 17, verse 6. The disciples went and caused trouble all over the world by preaching the gospel, and they now arrived in Thessalonica. Wow. Awesome. Let's go to uh, chapter 19, verse 8. This is going to be our last scripture in the, in the survey. I have two brief scriptures uh, Three. to close this out. Come on. But this is kind of the, 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 the prototypical kind of the the campus ministry scripture of the book of Acts. Chapter 19, verse 8, it says, Paul entered. If you want something to happen, you've got to enter. You've got to go. He entered the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them were obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. You know, sometimes you're going to go and you're going to preach at your school for three whole months. Wow. And no one's going to get baptized. Wow. You're going to study the Bible with tons of your friends, tons of your classmates, and they're going to walk away from God because they are obstinate and they refuse to believe and refuse to change for God. 
But what are you going to do? Are you going to give up? No. no. You're going to throw your Bible in the trash? No. I sure hope not. So what does Paul do? So Paul leaves. He takes the disciples with him, and he has daily discussions in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years. Daily discussions. For two years. And all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. So the province of Asia is about the size, it's about like modern day Turkey today. And so this is basically saying in two years an entire country was evangelized. Wow. Guys, I want you to imagine what would happen if we had daily discussions on all of your campuses for two years. Yeah. I think the entire city of Boston would be more than evangelized. We could probably evangelize all of New England in two years from the, the amount of power and conviction and influence yeah. that the campus yeah. students here in Boston yeah. have. Oh, wow. awesome. so, so what's my point? What's my point in all this? Why do we look at all these scriptures? Well, let's go to 1 John chapter 4. And John's going to tell us um, what this is all about. I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation because on, I read it last night and it just, it just snapped me in a different way. 1 John chapter 4, in verse 11 it says, Dear friends, since God loved us that much, meaning sending Jesus to die for his, our sins, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. Wow. So, what John is saying here is that none of you have seen God. The only one who's seen God face to face and lived was Moses. And none of us here are Moses. But, when you love the other disciples in this room, you get to see the face of God. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Think about that. You get to see the very face of God when you love your brother and your sister in Christ. When, when you fellowship with them. When you encourage them. When you call them to the standard of the word of God. Mm. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 3 to see how we do this practically. Okay. Come on. Let's go. This Hebrews awesome. chapter 3 and in, in verse 12, it's a very popular scripture, but... It needs to be preached every day. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sins of secretness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. What's this original conviction that the writer is talking about? Acts 2, 41-47, being devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to prayer, and to fellowship. This is the, the, the foundation of what Paul is trying, well, some people believe Paul wrote Hebrews, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews, that's a sermon for another time. That's what the writer here is trying to get across, and when he says encourage one another as long as it's called today, how many days out of the week do we call today? Every, every, day. Day. Every, day. every day. And so every day we need to be in one another's lives. But mm. this, this needs to be something that each of us initiates. Mm. Not, well, I'm just going to wait for my Bible talk leader to Ooh. come up with a hangout Ooh. or schedule a family time. Ooh. I'm going to wait for you know, someone else to reach out to me so that I feel loved. Oh. Ooh, you've got to initiate. Yeah. Oh, bro. You've got to put yourself in the fellowship. Come on, bro. Yeah. brother... Uh, who was here in Boston, his name is David Wright, said, and uh, he's out in Minneapolis now, but there, there was something that he said that, that I'll never forget, and it is, is really what has driven me in a lot of ways. He said, the kingdom is what you make it. The, the kingdom's not what Mike and Chanel make it. It's not what your Bible talk leader makes it. It's not what myself and Tyler make it. It's what each and every one of you yeah. makes it. And, and that's why people fall away. That's why people walk away from God and walk away from his kingdom. Because the kingdom is what they make it. 
when there's disciples that are hanging out together and spending time together, it's hard for me to understand how someone can look at God's kingdom and be like, the church is unloving. Yeah. Or disciples are not loving. Or disciples oh. are fake. Oh, it's, it, That's not the situation. Yeah. It's that you're not initiating, you're not putting yourself mm. into the fellowship. Yeah, that's a good point. That's good, bro. Yeah. So, my challenge from this last point is to be at every meeting of the body this week 15 minutes early. Yeah. Whether it's Bible talk, mm. whether it's midweek, mm. yeah. Friday night Devo, Whoa. or Sunday service. I want to encourage you guys, you were all early today. That was awesome. I honestly was like, oh, about to like change my third part because everybody's already got this. But wow. let's continue in it and let's continue to call one another to it. Let's close out back in Colossians chapter 3. I was going to like use some analogy or find a poem or something to read to close out the sermon, but I, I, I think the Word of God is, is, I know the Word of God is powerful enough by itself. So we're just going to close out with this. I think this really encapsulates everything that we've been talking about. Okay. Colossians 3 and verse 15, it says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ Dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. I love you all, and to God be all. Woo!